everyone. Welcome to First Friday for April. Um, scarcely seems like a whole month has gone by, and here we are back with First Friday and our celebrated object lesson program, now in virtual form. Um, and for those of us who are uninitiated to object lesson, object lesson is our First Friday salon discussion event where we invite someone from outside the studio to take a look in our permanent collection and choose a work. Basically, we just hand over the keys to the collection and they talk about a piece that really speaks to them. Um, so Katie is going to introduce tonight's speaker um, in one moment. But before we do that, I just want to mention a couple things. First of all, April is a really special month because that is the month that we acknowledge our um, Bob Stocksdale International Excellence in Wood Award winner. And we celebrate that award with, um, with the speaker event with our partners, Winter Tour um, Museum, Garden, and Library. So that event will be here in the Zoom space um, on April 22nd, which is a Thursday evening. And I encourage everyone to, um, to RSVP and attend that event. It is very, um, it's a very rich experience where we hear the perspective um, of the artist, but and their career in light of um, the legacy left by Bob Stocksdale, one of the country's um, most renowned master wood turners. So stick around for that. Um, Katie will put that link to the event up in the chat. Um, and I just have one more thing before I hand it over to her. And that is just to mention that we acknowledge that we're gathered in the unsurrendered and ancestral indigenous territory of the Leni Lenape and Wingo Hawking people who were and continue to be active stewards of these lands. We admit that the recognition is a small effort, but we hold up indigenous visibility and affirm the sovereignty for individuals and communities who live here now and for those who were forcibly removed from their homelands here. We at the Center for Art and Wood will work to hold the center accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. So with that, Katie, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Sorensen, and I'm with the Center for Art and Wood, of course. Um, if you've attended any of our programs, you've probably seen me. So welcome to Object Lesson, and, and happy first Friday. Uh, I'd love to introduce to you um, a wonderful uh, individual who is uh, not only a steward of Elf Elfers Alley and Elfers Alley Museum, but also a friend of the Center for Art and Wood, Ted Moss. And um, he is also um, the son of a, a, a ceramicist, as uh, we kind of talked about as we were letting everybody in. Um, he um, started out um, in art art museums and he grab, gravitated towards history and he received his MA from the Center for Public History at Temple University, another Temple alumni. We have one on our staff as well. Um, and recently Ted has been working on Elf First Alley Museum's podcast, the Alleycast. So we encourage all of you to check that out. I'll be uh, throwing a link to that in our um, chat momentarily. It's phenomenal um, and we love that and we will actually be a, a little bit a part of that uh, in uh, season two so we're excited about that. Um, so it's going to be featuring uh, the working lives and past residents um, and then uh, episodes will also feature um, uh, boarding house operations, working children, builders, and um, we're going to be touching a little bit on this in tonight's object lesson. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ted. Thank you, Ted. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to uh, be talking to you all tonight. Uh, I really enjoy this, uh, the object lesson series and, and a lot of the things that uh, the center has on uh, online. I've been really enjoying some of the, some of the videos uh, during during lockdown. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to start sharing my screen um, because I have a presentation and so you don't have to just only look at my face. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking about a piece by Skip Johnson, uh, the itinerant Turner's toolbox. Um, and just to give you a sense of sort of what we're, where we're going here, I'm going to start by introducing myself a little, um, and then we're going to sort of um, meet the piece. And then I want to talk uh, about the history of um, woodworkers uh, and woodworking in this neighborhood and on Elfris Alley uh, using the piece as sort of a, a mnemonic device or a touchstone. Um, so as uh, Katie said in my introduction, um, I am uh, the son of an artist. This is my dad. Um, and so I was exposed to sort of craft uh, at a pretty young age. Um, and the closest I got to, to doing uh, art or craft myself was taking a couple uh, printmaking classes in college. Um, and instead, I uh, went into uh, history. And eventually, uh, I, I was in the Midwest for a while, but eventually I came back to uh, the Philadelphia area for grad school um, at the Center for Public History at Temple University. Um, and my advisor there was Seth Brueggemann, who was the uh, one of the documentarians of the uh, ITE um, program in 2015. Uh, so some of you may, 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 may know him. Uh, I put this picture in here because uh, one of the real sort of keys of that program is the study of material culture. Um, this was a uh, our material culture class in 2017. We worked with the Independent Seaport Museum, so another sort of uh, Philly museum not that far away. Um, they are a collector of boats of uh, various kinds, and they had this one boat that had been uh, added to the collection, but had um, sort of <laughs> fallen into disrepair. It, it, it was in storage and it fell over and, and was damaged. Um, and they were going to deaccession it because it was similar to some other pieces they had, but they wanted us to document it before they did. Um, and that really um, sort of, um, we did a lot of interesting things working hands on with wood um, that sort of came back to me as I was thinking about um, this presentation. Um, but getting that master's degree um, got me into the museum world. Um, and a couple of years later, um, I started working at Elfrith Sally. So a lot of you will probably know um, of Elfrith Sally, but for those of you who don't, it's a very historic street in Philadelphia, right around the uh, corner from the center from Art and Wood. And the houses on the street have, were built between 1724 and 1836, and people are still living in them today. So um, in this particular photo, you can't really see too many signs of actual life, but um, you know, it's, it, the trash is going to be picked up tomorrow morning. So today there's, there's lots of signs of, um, of life on the street. Um, and what we do is interpret basically 300 years of uh, working people's lives on the street. Um, historically, we focused more on the 18th century, but one of the things we've been trying to do over the last three or four decades is, is talk more about the 19th and 20th century history um, on the street and even the 21st century. So that's a little bit what I'm going to do today, um, but we're also here to talk about this piece. Um, so this is the piece that, uh, this is the object uh, of tonight. And I saw this picture and I felt like I didn't really have a whole lot of uh, scale for this piece, um, but I saw it in person. Um, and here's what it looks like uh, in the gallery. So that gives you a little more sense of scale um, I'm not really sure. I should have looked up the dimensions. Uh, it's a big piece. Um, I took a selfie with it and, and my head was, you know, maybe around where that the, the, the keg on the top uh, top shelf is. Um, so it's, it's a pretty big piece and we're going to talk about it a little bit. Um, it was made by uh, Skip Johnson um, and uh, Nishay Jones is on this uh, call tonight. They did um, an object lesson a couple months ago about one of Skip's pieces and they introduced him better than I ever could. So uh, go go watch their talk. But uh, it says a lot about Skip that this is one of the photos that was submitted for his obituary. Uh, the newspaper wouldn't run it, but um, 
this he had sort of a, a quirky quirky sensibility about him um and that is seen in the piece in the inclusion um among other things of a, of a small keg um that goes to a little sort of mouthpiece that the the turner working at the lathe can uh, can drink out of um okay so now i'm gonna sort of highlight different asp components of this piece to sort of introduce different eras of this neighborhood's um, wood history, uh, as it were. So first, I want to look at the box itself. Um, I saw this box and I saw a lot of things. Uh, I'm sort of a museum person. So one of the first sort of uh, connections I made was to a, a cabinet of curiosities, perhaps, um, or a display case. But I also thought about the tradition of cabinet making um, in Philadelphia and specifically um, on El Sally. So um, I also want to want to back up and say that um, what I'm going to talk about tonight are things that I am learning about. This is a, a starting point of my learning, not an ending point of my learning. Uh, those of you who are more well versed in, in the wood uh, craft and, and wood trades uh, probably know much more about this than I do. Um, but this is a starting point. Um, and so I've just been learning about this uh, because I've been researching it for the, the podcast that Katie alluded to. Um, so cabinet making uh, sort of started at the end, very end of the, the 17th century in London. Um, it was a confluence uh, drawing on some uh, Asian furniture forms, some Northern European furniture forms, but basically it was pieces of furniture that were built around um, a dovetailed box. Um, now this isn't a dovetail box, this, is, this has box joints, um, but the box itself evokes to me some of those early cabinets. Um, and Philadelphia had a, a really strong cabinet making tradition. Uh, and we're lucky on Elfris Alley to have a, a cabinet maker uh, whose work is pretty well documented, not his work so much, but his account books are, are well um, researched. They are actually, I believe, at the archive at Winter Tour. And there's a really extensive article about them. His name is Daniel Trotter. Um, and he, in museum collections, is mostly known for his chairs. Um, I think there's one at Winter Tour. There's one at the Met. Um, there's a bunch of his furniture is at is in the Girard College uh, collection because Stephen Girard uh, bought a lot of furniture from him. Uh, but he lived and worked on the alley from 1773 to 1800. Um, and he came of age at a time uh, sort of right after the first generation or a significant generation of cabinet makers in Philadelphia had sort of stopped working. Um, and he really quickly rose to being one of the more prominent uh, cabinet makers of his time. I think um, in, the, in the one article about him, they talk about him being in the, the top five uh, of, of tax bracket people, um, of, of, of woodworkers basically. Um, and his, his chairs are, are sort of uh, known specifically for these ornaments in the backs, uh, in, the, in the middle of the slat backs. Um, now, one of the things, the other, one of the other connections I felt with this, uh, the box of Skip Johnson's piece um, is that among, it uses several woods uh, and among them are mahogany and walnut, which were um, the two woods that Daniel Trotter used most often. Um, and Trotter actually, um, he, he died in 1800 um, and his, his business did not pass to any of his family, uh, well, any of his sons, because um, his sons, he was able to get his sons into the, the track, the merchant track to become merchants. Um, but one of his uh, old apprentices, Ephraim Haynes, had married his daughter. <laughs> So became his son-in-law uh, and inherited the business. And I mentioned Ephraim Haynes because um, he also lived on the alley for a period of time, or at least worked there. Um, he had two of the houses on the street built. Um, and so he inherits this business in 1800. Only a few years later, I believe under a decade, um, he had sort of shifted away from making cabinets himself to operating a mahogany lumber yard. Um, and sort of shifted into a, a lumber merchant uh, kind of um, career. So there were lots of different uh, wood careers on the alley. Um, okay, let's loop back to the piece. 
And now I want to look at that next word in the title, itinerant. So uh, on this picture, I've highlighted the handle. Uh, this is a, a collection of tools that is ready to, to move. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this itinerant um, component is that uh, Daniel Trotter was really near the end of, of a period when uh, there was a really working apprenticeship model in Philadelphia. Um, during his lifetime, that model started to break down. Um, and by the time Ephraim Haynes gave up cabinet making, um, it was really in its sort of uh, last stages. And I want to, so here I made a little sort of timeline, to try to visualize this. So before about 1750, the apprenticeship model in Philadelphia, um, a young man would be apprenticed to uh, a master craftsperson for a term of about seven years. Um, and this relationship was one of ob obligation. Traditionally, there was very little in the way of um, a legalistic contract. It was uh, this child is going to get skills and in, in return they will, and, and also probably food and housing, and in return they will give essentially free labor uh, to the master craftsperson. Um, by the late 18th century, um, those apprenticeship relationships were becoming more um, detailed and transactional. So you get um, more, um, enumeration of the benefits that the apprentice is going to receive, and you get more enumerations of the expectations that the craftsman is going to receive in return. Um, and once a person finished an apprenticeship, it became a journeyman. Um, during the, the, the heyday of, of apprenticeships, those journeymen uh, were sort of they were, they were looking to make their mark. They were, they were looking to make enough money that they could go out on their own as a master, master crafts person. Um, but beginning around 1800, even before, um, they started to uh, work for wage labor instead of more sort of informal agreements. And uh, the system started to break down uh, because there was suddenly a, a surplus of labor and one thing that master crafts people started to do is take on a lot of apprentices. So they would have, instead of having five apprentices and five journeymen, they'd take on nine apprentices and then they would hire a journeyman every once in a while. Um, and what this created was a really real glut in the market um, of a lot of different trades, but specifically uh, cabinet makers, where you had a lot of journeymen uh, cabinet makers who had no route to being becoming master cabinet makers um, who were losing out on work to apprentices who would then become more journeymen. Um, and it was this really unsustainable um, sort of development. Um, in the 1790s, journeyman cabinet makers um, began to organize. And in 1794, they uh, published a list of prices uh, where they basically standardized the price list for what they would do. Um, you can think of this as um, they're sort of like gig workers. Um, and instead of having the terms of what they're working for being given to them, they're trying to standardize that and um, demand that from the masters. Um, it took a couple of years, but in 1796, they released another price list that this time uh, was signed off on by three master cabinet makers in Philadelphia. Uh, one of the organizers of the journeyman uh, who actually signed off on that 1796 price list uh, was a man named Thomas Janvier, who actually uh, worked quite a lot in Daniel Trotter's shop. So he was uh, very sort of connected to this, this shifting world. Um, by 1820, it was a problem again, uh, and the journeyman actually opened up their own shop. <laughs> uh, they made what was called a, a ware room. Um, where they could sell directly uh, pieces of furniture that they made on spec um, or take commissions. So um, for the itinerant Turner in Johnson's piece, maybe that itinerance is freedom. Maybe that means that he's not connected to anyone. He can go wherever he wants. Um, but if he was in a place like Philadelphia that had this uh, real oversupply of journeymen, uh, it may have been a really uncomfortable and a necessity uh, to become itinerant and, and go wherever the work 
uh, would, would, would find you. Um, now, I haven't forgot that this is, this is a, a, a toolbox for turners, and I've been talking mostly about cabinet makers. Um, so some cabinet makers in, in Philadelphia were also turners. Um, Daniel Trotter does not seem to have done a, a, a bunch of turning. Uh, we do have some records from his account books of him um, hiring out to turners as well as carvers and painters and, and many other craft people. Um, but we do have a, a history of turners on El Frisali as well. Um, and there are a few of them. I want to just touch on one. Uh, his name is Harmon Bao. Um, and he lived on Elfris Alley for about 60 years, from roughly 1830 to roughly 1890, um, which on a, a street that was known for uh, being people's sort of landing place in Philadelphia, where they would stay until they could afford to move somewhere else, um, is a little notable. It's a pretty long stay uh, for an individual. Um, and Harmon Bau, um, he actually built uh, or had built. It's a little tricky to know whether he did the building himself uh, or paid someone to build it, but he uh, had the, the house right in the middle of this image, the very tall one. Um, it's basically four stories tall. It's the tallest house on the street, um, and that was built in 1836. That's the, the newest house on the street, um, and he, I believe, owned the house next to it um, during, during the building of that house. Um, but he's a really interesting person, not just for his long uh, term stay on the street, um, but also because he he got involved in, in some really interesting things in his life. I, I was looking for him in uh, in the newspaper archives and I found that he was an active member of uh, the Masonic Lodge. He, he had uh, multiple committees that he was on as part of the Masons through the uh, 1830s and 40s. Uh, and then he got involved in politics and in 18. 41, I want to say, uh, he ran for common council uh, on an abolitionist ticket in the 1850s. He joined uh, the American Party, also known as the Know Nothings, uh, which seems like a pretty big sw swing uh, from, from the abolitionist party to the Know Nothings. Uh, and he actually ran for sheriff um, with them in, I believe, 1854. Uh, and then in 1861, he shifted to uh, a, a very different part, two different parties, actually. He was part of uh, one party that was called the Citizens Party and one that was called the People's Party. Uh, and with those, on those tickets, he ran for state office. Um, and he actually got very close. He, he lost, but it was a, an election that had a lot of contested votes um, and I think went to the courts. Um, so it's an, just an interesting window into the life of a 19th century term. Um, but one of the reasons I also wanted to talk about Harmon Baugh is that in, in his lifespan on the alley, uh, this street went from uh, a street that was very much characterized by uh, artisans' work to one that was very much surrounded by factories. Um, so in 1868, one of the buildings right, almost right across from him, uh, was actually knocked down and, and turned into a stove factory. So we have a, an 1868 stove factory facade on the street as well, in addition to these 18th and 19th century houses. Um, just behind many of the houses uh, were, were factory buildings. So he really sort of bridged this shift in the, in the neighborhood. And then, of course, uh, another turner in the neighborhood who uh, bridged all kinds of shifts in time uh, is the John Grass Wood Turning Company, which is about uh, halfway between <laughs> Elfrid Sally and, and the Center for Art and Wood. Um, and John Grass came to Philadelphia uh, from Germany as a teenager um, and sort of uh, got his start in a, in a wood turning shop and then opened his own shop with a partner um, in 1911, which I believe is when this picture was taken. They incorporated under his name. Um, and in 1916, I want to say, they moved into the current uh, or the, the, loca the last location. Uh, 146 North 2nd Street, where they were um, and operated as a wood turning company until 2003. And on the ground in front of these folks, you can see some of the products they made, um, bowling pins, bowling balls, bowls. Um, they were also known, uh, I've heard, for their uh, flagpoles and their policemen's nightsticks. Um, 
But my understanding is that, that one of the reasons they were able to have such longevity as a, as a company was, was sort of the, the smallness, the, the nicheness um, of, of their craft. Um, you know, not very many um, pretty traditional wood turning companies lasted that long. Um, and yes, they, they had steam power and they had electric power, um, but it was still pretty, pretty, uh, pretty old school construction is my understanding. Um, where are we going from here? Okay, I want to loop back to the piece one more time um, and highlight the space around this piece, so this, this gray void that we have here. Because as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know, uh, sort of the, the next shift in, in woodworking in Philadelphia is, is the shift to galleries and to museum work. Uh, so here we have the Center for Art and Wood. And I'm sure there are people on this call that know much more about this sort of more recent history, um, how uh, craft enjoyed a really strong renaissance in Philadelphia. Um, but I really do think that the, the appreciation of crafts like turning, like carving, like furniture making um, in Philadelphia brings us a little bit um, full circle in a way. Um, now, the reason that I've been listening, or I've, been, I've been learning all about this and, and reading all about this um, is that I have been working on an episode of our podcast about uh, the story of woodworking uh, on Elphis Alley and, and in Philadelphia. Um, and I would be truly remiss if I didn't uh, thank uh, both the Center for Art and Wood, but also specifically Chris Storb, who's on this call. Uh, Chris uh, chatted with me several times about this history and filled in a lot of the gaps that I uh, didn't have myself. I also think he's an interesting um, sort of connection to this story in that he began as a painter and a sculptor uh, and became a furniture conservator and uh, a woodworker working in traditional methods uh, in his own right. Again, sort of tying that loop um, and, and looping back to the origins uh, of woodworking in Philadelphia. Um, and as, uh, as we've, we've been talking about this podcast, here, here's, the, here's the logo for the podcast. Uh, check it out. Uh, there will be an episode um, that will go much more in depth on this topic in season two. Um, very many thanks to Chris uh, for his help. Uh, and you can hear his voice uh, on, on that podcast as well. That should be coming out in the next um, couple months. Um, I whipped through my material, um, but that is what I have prepared. I will stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to answer any questions you have or, or chat with you all. Thanks so much, Ted. That was fantastic. And my thirst is um, magnified for your <laughs> podcast and can't wait for the woodworking episode. There's so, there's so many layers. Um, between, you know, we're talking about two to 300 years mm -hmm. of working in Old City, just yeah. in our immediate neighborhood, two sides of an alley yeah. um, represented here. And, and to have a taste of that tonight is, is just a delight. Um, I know I had, I had a few questions and I think that I saw these questions um, um, reflected also in the chat um, and um, one of those so uh, it's but they're very simple questions first of all so Harmon Harmon Bao whose life I now have to explore yeah deep, um, a wood turner who was active in 19th century politics yeah um, and building and lived right in our neighborhood so was his workshop in 125 Elfer Sally as well so it's it's, it's very it's very possible. I don't know. I know a little more about uh, his predecessor. So, um, so he built 125, he, and but at some point he owned 127 as well. Um, and those lots really connect all of the stories that that I talked about today because um, in 1783, maybe no 85 something, Daniel Trotter bought most of a, a run of how a run of lots. Uh, including those two. And he immediately sold two of them off, but he built at least one wood shop, possibly two on those two lots. Um, when Ephraim Haynes was running the business after Trotter's death, it was one of those lots that was operating as the mahogany yard. Um, and then 
the both lots be passed into the ownership of uh, a widow named uh, Susanna Sim, um, and she in turn sold them to a turner before Harmonbaugh uh, named Barney Schumo, um, who built a house on one of the lots, but probably kept one of the buildings that had that had dated back to Trotter and, and Haynes's time as his workshop. Now he his he's an interesting story as well because he actually lived across the street when he was building that house, um, and um, about eighteen I think that house was completed in around eighteen twenty maybe, um, and while it was being built, he wrote his will and he was aware that when he was going to die, uh, his family probably wouldn't wouldn't. Uh, be able to afford to live there and in fact they weren't uh, so they moved back across the street to uh, their their previous house upon his death um, so I don't know that he lived in that house very often but he used uh, one of those wood shops and so it's very possible that um, Harmon Bao either used um, a space that Shumo might have included a workspace in that in that house that he built he might have used the, the workshop that was still on the empty lot or the empty lot um, before building the house. I don't really know. Um, that's definitely something um, I want to check out. There's also, he's just an interest, Harmon Val's an interesting guy. If you look in in, um, in newspaper databases, his name is, it's very distinctive. So it's easy to know that you're you're talking right. about the right person. Um, at one point, he, he lost a, a gold key that had sentimental value. And he put an ad in the paper saying, please, please re re uh, return this key that I lost. Uh, I was walking here when I lost it. <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. Just like the next door app in the Yes, in the exactly. <laughs> Um, and then I was I I was um, intrigued just by your plotting of a timeline yeah. for El Fusali. Um, I you know we talk a lot about Philadelphia being the workshop of the world, mm -hmm. but I didn't realize that El Fusali was actually the landing pad for a lot of new arrivals to uh, Philadelphia. Yeah. So so um, in the in the eighteenth or in the nineteenth and twenty eighteenth uh, nineteenth and into the early 20th century, really. Um, if you looked at places where uh, recent immigrants to Philadelphia were living, um, and especially if you looked at the overlap of recent immigrants and people who were doing uh, manual labor or sort of um, less well compensated work, uh, many of them were gonna be living on the outskirts of the city, or they were gonna be living in the narrow alleyways um, that ran in between the more main thoroughfares. And El Sally was one of those. So um, in the 19th century, there's a really uh, strong history of German immigrants uh, living on the street. There's a whole bunch of German shoemakers. Um, and then um, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, there's still Germans, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of Irish um, immigrants. Um, and as well as then you get a whole, you know, you get a wave of, uh, you know, Russian Jewish immigrants, you get some, um, some other Eastern Europeans in there as well. But um, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that these houses by the late 19th century even were pretty old uh, and they hadn't really been uh, kept up very well in many cases. So they were both small and old, which made them relatively affordable, but also not necessarily great to live in. Um, and so that made them an attractive place for people who were newcomers to the city trying to find sort of a, a, a footprint. Um, and there were some families that stayed on the, the alley for a long time. There's a few of the Irish families that um, lived in multiple houses on the street over a long period of time. Um, there's, uh, you know, the O'Drain family has a, a long history, the Reardon family, um, but definitely, definitely a lot of, um, a lot of immigrants and a lot of migrants as well. We have, we have a few people who clearly moved to Philadelphia as part of um, the Great Migration era. Um, not a whole lot uh, of Black residents on the alley, but definitely some. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay, um, Nache has their hand up. Um, Michelle, do you want to um, take it away? Yes. Um, it's, it's just, I was particularly excited about this object lesson because it basically brought two of the 
two things I was um, looking into for my thesis, which was uh, Fritz Ali and the Ali kids, <laughs> and also the center. It's like bringing them together. So it, this kind, this was like one of the um, object lessons I was most excited about. And plus it brought back, brought in a bit of my research about mm -hmm. Skip Johnson. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's kind of like the Avengers of object lessons. <laughs> <laughs> And I just wanted to comment about um, this, like doing this research mm -hmm. um, made me see Alfred Ali in a different light because mm -hmm. I grew up in Philly and I remember how I wasn't really interested in Alfred Ali when I was younger and would go there on school field trips because mm -hmm. it just seemed like it was, it the, those stories weren't inclusive of people mm -hmm. that looked like me. So I was just, I kind of got bored with it really quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was just like, oh, so now there is stories of there of people that look like me. There is things oh. that a little, uh, uh, a, bl a black kid coming on a school field trip could be interested in. A Latinx kid coming on a school field trip could be interested in, um, whether it comes from the perspective of, oh they made these things and maybe someone in my family makes similar things or mm -hmm. you know uh these white people are not the only people that are coming into philly at this time so to highlight those and not only as tokens but as people with stories and things like that i i feel like it's such a it it makes Alfred Ali and the stories of the past that come out of that came out of that street so much more real for so many more Philadelphians. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ted, I appreciate your work and thank you for helping me with mine. Of course, thank you, Nishay. That's really lovely. Thank you. Uh, that's that's really my hope. I mean, I think I think we're a great um, place to think about Philadelphia at large. Um, you know, this street has has been there for, for three centuries of Philadelphia. A lot of the same forces that affected other neighborhoods uh, affected these homes. They're just still there. Um, and so it makes it a really useful place. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that that was useful to you uh, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you, Nishay, for mentioning that. That's so important. And it's so, that's also so very meaningful. Um, Apropos adventures, adventures um, of uh, object <laughs> lesson, um, there was another connection made, and that was Ted's mention of um, of the John Grass Wood Turning Company. Mm -hmm. And um, last year, Sean Kelly delivered an object lesson about those um, police billy clubs. Oh, nice, so good. I, I saw the other. Um, there was another uh, object lesson about about um, the John Grass Wood, Wood Turning Company that I saw, but I, I missed Sean's. Dominique Ellis, who's um, our local historian um, um, and archivist, um, and also who holds her own library of um, not only materials, but also um, objects from the John Grassley Turning Companies and, and photographs, an extensive photographic library. So she's someone to look up to for, yeah, for sure. one day for a podcast. She yeah, knows. no, I think, I, I think there's so much more to that story. Um, and it's so it's it's recent enough that there's probably like more documentation that she has than I could find for most of these things. Um, so I want to loop back because um, I, I sort of answered wh uh, what I knew about Bao's workshop. I actually know a little more about Trotter's workshop, um, although it's a little confusing. Um, so he he began his life on Elfrith Alley um, as a newlywed. He and his wife rented uh, a house, uh, number 114 today. Um, and they lived there for a period while he had a, uh, a workshop that he was renting um, that was on Water Street, um, so pretty nearby as well. Um, in the 1790s, he built a house and possibly workshop um, at uh, 100 North Water or North Front Street, so also very nearby. Um, it seems like that's where his house was. His workshop was probably where I was talking about um, Bao's house was later there, um, but it was also listed. Sometimes they're listed uh, on the same in the same breath uh, on the directories. So he may have used it as his warehouse. He may have showed off his work in his home. It's not really clear. Um, yeah. 
Sorry, I wanted to loop back to that while I saw it. <laughs> Thanks so much for doing that. That's fantastic. Um, we have a question from Rachel Hess, mm -hmm. um, who enjoyed the many connections that you made between this piece and the um, and woodworking in Alfred's Alley. Mm -hmm. um, and she asks, what do you know about the perspective Skip Johnson brought to this piece? And was it consistent with other pieces that he made? And I will let you answer that question. Sure. I mean, I think uh, lots of people on this call, I think, are... are... Uh, familiar with Skip's piece, uh, the piece that Nache talked about a little bit ago, um, you can watch their object lesson, um, was uh, a, a anthropomorphized potato peeling stool uh, that looked a little like a robot. So there's there's a there's an element in pl with of play with lots of things he did. Um, I I don't know if I could characterize um, the the style or the techniques necessarily. Um, when I was looking for more, a little more information about him, one of the things that I found was late in life, one of his sort of puckish, prankish uh, pieces, uh, not out of wood, but he made styrofoam uh, tombstones to, to things that had gone away. Uh, so like a, a, a five cent soda, I think, was one of them or something. And he he put them along his um, the edge of his property. And at some point, they were added to a database. This was in Wisconsin. They were added to a database of cemeteries so that a state worker actually showed up his house one day and was like, do you know anything about a cemetery near here? We're going to widen this road and we have to think about what we need to do with the cemetery. <laughs> and it was uh, these, these uh, styrofoam tombstones that he had that he had created um so i think that says a lot about sort of his style um but i, I couldn't speak more about the, the specific techniques well does anyone else have any questions um for for ted tonight or for Nache? yeah about Skip or about um, Old City woodworking history and Elfra Sally. If not, I'm gonna invite everybody to unmute themselves and say hello, um, if you like, and um, just pipe in before we log off and um, wish you a festive and safe uh, weekend. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, Aileen. Hey, Ted. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Ted. It's Jennifer. Hi. How are you doing? Thanks for talking to us. Of I course. Oh, there she <laughs> is, Jennifer. Hey. <laughs> hey, Jennifer. Hello. Hi. Is that Elaine? Yes, it is. Oh, hey, Elaine. How are you? Uh, hanging in there I <laughs> like hear everybody ya. else oh yeah <laughs> yep. I ted i um i have to feel like you have a lot um of stories um about the neighborhood that you're just ready to tell <laughs> at the slightest <laughs> prompting so um now i'm really curious like i feel like i need to sit down with you and, and sure talk about old city. Oh, definitely. i mean i I'm learning more every day. I mean, somebody like Elaine could tell you a lot more than, than, than me, but. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of that, so uh, here's a question that I've had for a long time. When I first moved to um, Philadelphia and Old City, somebody told me about, um, about the, the streets of Old City were actually originally laid with end grain locks. And then some of these were paved over. And so they actually, if you were to excavate a lot mm -hmm. of the streets, the, the blocks would still be there. Do you have more information about that? So there was a piece on this. I want to say it might be on the Philly history blog There's um, that I read a few years ago. And there was still one street in, in Philadelphia where somebody had done some excavation and, and found some of the end grain blocks. I don't know where it was i think it was one of those like one block long alleys um but i can't speak to the the specific ones right around Alfred's alley um the surface of Alfred's alley itself uh dates to 1975 uh 
when in preparation for the bicentennial, the city put a new surface on, um, which actually means that there's a, a really great group in Philly of um, narrow historic streets. There's a, a like a, a society of people who live on these streets and, and we're excluded from it uh, because our, our, uh, our street surface is, is not sufficiently historic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and the reason it was resurfaced, I believe, is, is to make it look more 18th century. Uh, it previously had Belgian block paving, um, which to, to the folks in the 1970s felt like, uh, oh, that's a 19th century thing. Um, I also think that part of the, the resurfacing was uh, to run electric wires under the street rather than uh, I think they, previous to that, they had been strung sort of house to house, which uh, really cut down on the uh, colonial aesthetic. <laughs> All right. All right. So more aesthetic than pragmatic, really. I think so. Oh, mm -hmm. good. Somebody posted the link to the Atlas Obscura piece about uh, Kamek Street. Oh, yeah. great. Great, 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 great. great. Yeah, there's some beautiful pictures of the end grain wood there. Um, that street, from what I know of, they they did have to pave it over, but they were going, and I don't know where it stands right now, but they were going to uh, restore it. Ooh. Wow, fascinating. Hey, Ted. Thank hey. you, Ted. That was good. <laughs> it was. We enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Um, Ted, when is the uh, pod? You mentioned that there's a, a yeah. good wedding focused podcast. Coming yeah, up. so our, our second season, uh, we haven't set a, a firm launch date because we're still working on it. Um, but I'm hoping that that one starts releasing in June. Um, so the first season of that podcast, we tried to sort of provide an overview of, of the 300 years of the street um, from the stories of um, the very beginnings of it to the beginnings of it as a, as a tourist site in the 20th century and, and the, the reconstruction of, of the museum house. Um, with the season two, we're taking a more topical approach and each episode will be focused on a different kind of work. Um, I don't know, we haven't finalized the order of them um, because they're all sort of next to each other. You know, we have a woodworking piece. We have, uh, as Katie mentioned, a, a boarding house um, episode. So I'm not sure exactly when it will air. Um, as soon as I set a, a firm launch date, I will send you send you the, the, the release schedule. Um, I think it's the episode that is the furthest along right now. Uh, that doesn't mean that it will be the first one released, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping June or July um, for, for release for that one. Um, Great. We'll be happy to um, share you should listen to the entire first season. It's really good. I'm yeah. a subscriber. I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely a subscriber. Good. Oh, wow. I'm glad. <laughs> um, yeah, when you when that schedule comes out, we will be very, very happy to share that with yeah. um, with all of the center's crowd. Oh, I know they'll they'll love I'm to excited. hear that. Great. Well. If there are no further questions, I thank everyone for coming today. It's so lovely to welcome in the month of April with all of you here. And um, don't forget to sign up for the um, Stocksdale Award event. You won't wanna miss that um, on April 22nd. And, um, and stick around for more. And uh, in the meantime, we all will have another object lesson in the beginning of May. So be sure and come back for that as well. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, Nava. Thank you all for uh, inviting me. Have a wonderful weekend and a wonderful month. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Thanks, Ted. Have a good one. Thanks, Ted. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thanks, Ted.